Hello everyone and welcome to AIDS Map Live HIV Prevention Special. My name is Susan Cole and I'm thrilled to have an absolutely tremendous panel of speakers um, joining us today on this important topic. I will bring um, everyone on one at a time to say hello. First of all, can we have Gus Cairns? Hello, everybody. Hello, Gus. Gus, for those of you who don't know, is one of the editors at NAM AIDS Map, an HIV prevention campaigner, co-chair of the Proud Prep Study, a psychotherapist, and living with HIV since 1985. Is that all correct, Gus? It is, yeah. It's wonderful to have you on and to see you virtually when I was with you in person at the week before last. How did you find attending a physical conference? Um, I'd forgotten how tiring they were, um, but I'd also uh, forgotten how nice it was to meet people from uh, who you haven't seen for ages all over the place. Um, and I've uh, just in the process of writing up the panel that you were on about uh, COVID. So... Excellent. Well, I hope you say very nice things about me, at least. Okay, yeah. Gus, I will... <laughs> we will see you in a moment. If next, can we have Professor Sheena McCormack? Hello, Susan. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Sheena. Lovely to have you on. For those of you who don't know Sheena, she's a clinical scientist at MRC Clinical Trials Unit at UCL, who's worked on HIV vaccine, microbicides, and PrEP trials since 1994, as well as being an HIV doctor at 56 Dean Street. Where do you get the time? <laughs> Well, 1994 is a long time ago, Susan. I have to say that is making me feel quite old. <laughs> Wonderful. And it was lovely to also see you in person Indeed. at the EX conference. How yeah. did you find Also, like here? us, it was just so energising to, to see people again. And I, actually, I really like the kind of hybrid format of the conference you know you could join the early session in the morning at seven from your hotel room um, and then be there in person for you know the later sessions but it was just great to see people yeah really really good I enjoyed it wonderful and it was brilliant being on a panel with you so I enjoyed that very much too <laughs> fantastic and I will ask you some questions about that later so be ready. Uh, next, can we have Dr. Vanessa Appiah? Okay, fingers crossed. Vanessa is coming, but while she is on her way, I will let you know that she is an HIV <laughs> consultant <laughs> and clinical lead for sexual health at Barts Health NHS Trust and medical director of the HIV charity, NAS. Hello, Vanessa. Hi, Susan. Sorry, I dropped off. <laughs> <laughs> and so Vanessa is actually joining us from a hospital, is that yes, right? Yes, I am. I'm at the Royal London, so I I, I don't know the the I, the Wi-Fi doesn't seem to be doing it ourselves justice. But anyway, <laughs> well, I actually thought that like you would be the one person. It's like yes, you're going to be having brilliant <laughs> internet. But yeah, fingers yeah. crossed. Fingers crossed, we'll be fingers all right. Crossed, it's all going to be fine. And finally, if Winifred Ikolai is joining us, hopefully, um, but has been having a few technical issues, but we'll, we'll try and sort out Winifred's internet connection. But for those of you who don't know, Winifred is an award-winning HIV prevention advocate and public health practitioner. She has spent several years coordinating both HIV and sexual and reproductive health services throughout Uganda, including PEPFAR's Dream programming. But it looks like we are having a few issues with her connection. So fingers crossed we'll be able to get her back so she can share her important 
insights. But for those of you joining us, do please get your questions across because I have a very glamorous assistant waiting in the background. <laughs> 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 And look, here is Matthew Hodson, Executive <laughs> Director of NAM and also the co-chair of the EX conference. Hello, oh, Matthew. It's, it's such a joy to be here and to be spending most of the evening backstage. I will be monitoring both Twitter and Facebook. So if you do have any questions for the panel, drop them in the comments underneath the Facebook post or in you know, do a tweet underneath the tweet on, on Twitter and I will try and get that to the panel and make sure that they, the question is asked. Wonderful, thank you very much. Please keep Matthew very busy with the questions. <laughs> 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 okay wonderful thank you Matthew and if I can have on all of my guests please okay wonderful there are four of us hopefully Winifred will be joining us soon but I thought a good way to start is discussing prep so Gus for people who may not be familiar with prep can you explain the difference between PrEP and PEP, please. Yes, well, um, PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, has been with us as, as long as we've had HIV drugs, really. I mean, it started off, you know, an, as a hospital measure when doctors accidentally sort of pricked themselves with a needle uh, that had been exposed to HIV. Um, and initially it was like kind of this really sort of punitive thing where you had to take HIV drugs for a month. Um, you had to take them immediately or as soon as possible after the possible exposure to HIV. Um, the problem with PEP is that it's never really been subject to a scientific trial because you can't. It's because it's by definition an, an emergency measure and you can't expose somebody to HIV to see if it works. Um, <clears throat> but from the early 2000s onwards, the idea of PrEP came along, which was the idea that you could take HIV drugs before a possible exposure to HIV, which is a very different thing, because there is not uh, an accident, it's something you're contemplating, which was one of the reasons I think PrEP originally was, you know, controversial. Um, but then they did a lot of scientific trials, including the one me and Sheena were involved in, which proved beyond doubt that it is spectacularly um, effective in preventing HIV. If you take um, 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 uh, a couple of HIV drugs before the possible exposure to HIV, and that's the difference between PEP and PrEP. As time goes by, I think they'll draw closer to each other. Because as uh, another PrEP expert, Jean-Michel Molina, was saying to me the other day, is it that much difference if you take two pills before you get exposed to HIV or if you take two pills immediately afterwards? And I think as, as time goes by, the idea of HIV prevention using pills um, will tend, and the difference between PEP and PrEP, will tend to get um, less distinctive. Um, but at the moment, PrEP is the one that's all the rage and which lots and lots of people in the world are starting to take. Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that, Gus. And, and Sheena, um, England's PrEP impact trial, I believe the largest PrEP demonstration study ever conducted, recently released data. What do we know now about how effective PrEP actually is? So it was, uh, yeah, released at the conference that we were all at um, the week before last. Um, the, the main results and um, the data uh, show actually really kind of confirm in many ways what we saw in Proud that, you know, over an 80% reduction um, in HIV, um, if you compare those on the trial who ha were using PrEP to people who were attending the clinics and could have been part of the trial but chose not um, to take PrEP, um, the reduction overall, you know, was, was extremely impressive. Of course, since the time when we did PROUD and the Vanessa was involved in that study too, um, the overall rate of HIV um, in the UK has has gone down. And, and that's, that's, I think, I believe that PrEP's played a very large role in that, but it's certainly not the only role. And the more frequent testing, the early treatment, these have all contributed importantly to this decline that, that we have seen uh, in, in the UK in, in amongst gay and bisexual men uh, who have sex with other men particularly. Um, we did 
managed to um, to reach others. You know, we had a target of one in ten, and we achieved one in twenty in terms of people from other groups. But it, I think that actually probably is one of the largest proportions of any other uh, demonstration project in in a, in a European setting, anyway. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. And and, and Vanessa, why would you say prep uptake generally is lower for in women? Um, I think there are a number of reasons. Um, I think, first of all, it's um, awareness. Um, so it just quite simply that the awareness that we have amongst men who have sex with men is simply not the same as amongst women. And there's a lot of work being um, approached to target that, but that just, that isn't the case. I think also being aware of prep and taking prep you have to think that it's el you're eligible for it and i think just in the way of a lot of messaging um about prep and also wider about sexual wellness in women um, a lot of women don't see themselves as candidates of taking prep they don't see that they may be at risk of hiv and then therefore don't even consider prep in their kind their whole protection so they'll think of condoms um they'll think of um, abstinence um, they'll think of contraception for pregnancy but prep doesn't always come into the equation and i think also another issue is that um there's a responsibility for clinicians as well to raise that awareness um, amongst women and i don't think we're very good at that um, within our consultations when someone comes in for them to consider prep so i think it's many different layers to it and and what do you think that we can do to address that I think definitely education um, and positioning it in people's mindsets. Um, I think there's also um, education amongst clinicians, raising awareness to say in the consultations, um, bring it forward. So don't let women have to um, seek it. Let us bring it front and center. I think also um, for me, there's a, a bigger context and particularly in um, racially minoritized women about um, talking about sex, talking about relationships, um, and having a wider conversation about it. And I think there's a lot of stigma about um, sex. There's a lot of stigma about HIV. There's a lot of stigma about um, PrEP. And so I think that there needs to be a lot of work in terms of tackling that stigma and education and repositioning it as part of your agency and something really positive to do is really important. Yeah, thank you. And, and Sheena, how do you go about talking about PrEP to women? Uh, well, <laughs> that's, that's a very a good question. I think those, uh, I think Vanessa's hit the nail on the head. It starts with a conversation about sex. So I think being comfortable talking about sex is a really important part of what we can do and making it easier for people. So raising that issue yourself, I think bringing it to the clinic, trying to bring humor, make people feel comfortable in that setting. And, you know, and, and then asking the questions, you know, we do have a pro forma in the clinic setting, which makes us go through questions that you sometimes think, actually, you know, is this a question I need to ask everybody? Has anybody ever hurt you or made you feel afraid or made you have sex against your will? It's so important to ask those questions. And, you know, if they weren't stuck on that pro forma, we might forget to do it. Um, so I, I think I think Vanessa is absolutely right. You know, making it easy for people to tell you that they that they that they're vulnerable, and and if you give people the information, I, I think the webinars that Gus organised on prep for women, I, I really like that take home message. If you give women the information, they can work it out themselves. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and Gus, um, how about prep? for trans women and what do we know about the interaction between the hormones they may be taking and prep right yes because we also had a couple of webinars um on uh, for the trans community and um, one organized by the community themselves um i think the news there is reassuring um certainly trans uh, people men and women were very worried about possible interactions between prep and hormones but it now appears that the uh, interactions are quite slight, um, probably directed in the direction of possible reductions, slight reductions in the levels of, of the PrEP drugs, not the hormones. They don't seem to be affected at all. Um, and, 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 but, but, but probably not of any great clinical significance, you know. So that, that's interesting. During that research, 
um, we discovered that trans people take a huge variety of different hormones. I think from my point of view as a, as a sort of cis man, I had this idea that the trans community was one sort of like unified group of women and another unified group of men who were all taking hormones. And actually, no, uh, they often do it on a very ad hoc basis using different uh, formulations, things like that. Um, even the question of how many trans people there are depends on you asking the right questions about how they feel about themselves, what do they actually do, um, and all that sort of thing. So I think um, the news is reassuring, and I also think the news is reassuring in, this, in, in terms of the proportion of trans people who are connected to sexual health services who are taking PrEP now, which is quite high. But there are a lot of trans people out there who do not particularly access sexual health services and we don't know so much about their HIV needs. Okay, thank you very much. And we seem to have Winifred with us. Hello, Winifred. I'm not sure if you're frozen or you're keeping really still. Um, but um, Winifred, um, if, you're, if your connection is good enough to answer, I'd like to know about the availability of PrEP in your region in Uganda. I think Winifred is frozen. Vanessa. Um, <laughs> you can ask about Uganda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> going to let you down. Yeah. <laughs> no, I but, can what say I did... a little bit, Susan, if you, yeah, if you thank love you. it. Well, we're doing a we're doing a study which is uh, very complicated. It's, it's kind of a vaccine trial. But it, but there, it does also include an offer of, uh, of prep to everybody. And um, before we started that study, we were we were uh, enrolling people and following them, uh, offering them HIV testing and following them for for HIV and referring um, for prep. And actually, I think the team there did a very good job because they managed to get twenty percent of, um, and this is a men and women mainly mainly heterosexual cohort. Uh, going to um, the PrEP provider locally. And if we look across the sort of UK clinic data, our sort of coverage is about 10%. So the fact that they managed to uh, get 20% of people to go was, I think, a really, a really great achievement. And, you know, Uganda's been amazing at taking part in so many of the PrEP trials. And that really helps in the community to get those conversations going mm. and raising awareness. Do you think that we can learn lessons in the UK in terms of um, like prep rollout in African countries? I think we can. I think there, there are many countries where, you know, Kenya is another example in South Africa where they've done great work on creation, de demand creation, I think that's what they call it. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's great adverts. It's sort of, um, again, it's helping, I think, to have these conversations amongst peers about sex and, uh, mm -hmm. and increasing that sense that women can give each other um, of, of the, uh, that this would be something useful to them. Uh, I don't know, Vanessa, I think you were also nodding there. Do you think so too? <laughs> Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think that um, so uh, some of the experience I have is from Ghana, but there um, it, it's about being creative. So they haven't got all the systems in place that we do. And so they have to think about, OK, how do we access our key co key populations? How do we keep them engaged? And so a lot of their work is really outreach based um, and they're, they're not as they haven't quite got up to the stage as um, Uganda and other areas. But I think thinking outside of the box and not just <laughs> being focused on the clinical setting, but really having a system that allows you to go go to the people as well has worked really well there. And I, it's, it's quite exciting. I think they're doing a lot of work with peer-based networks mm -hmm. um, and they, they did that work um, in MSM and they're now trying to scale that up in women. So yes, I think there is definitely a lot to learn from there. Yeah. Wonderful. And, and Gus, what challenges was challenges are we seeing in the rollout of PrEP in Eastern, Euro Eastern European countries? Yeah, um, I'm really glad you asked me that, um, which I, uh, and because I was talking to um, an HIV prevention conference in the very first HIV prevention conference organized by the community in Istanbul um, on Sunday, uh, which is fantastic news. Um, uh, they haven't got any PrEP, you know, a very conservative country, all that sort of thing. Um, 
And during that, I did some research, and there's been an absolute explosion of PrEP provision in Africa in the last year, even despite COVID. Uh, and there are countries now um, at least uh, providing some PrEP um, that never did before, including places like Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and uh, one of the largest um, PrEP uh, and southern um, countries to have suddenly started um, rolling out a lot of PrEP is Zambia. They're doing really well. Um, and so, yes, I think we can learn uh, lessons from Africa. And I think PrEP is particularly conducive to um, um, demedicalization de in the sense of you still have to test people for HIV, you still have to test people for side effects, but in terms of getting it to people. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to go to some big clinic and get quizzed by a nurse. There are ways of doing it which are much more sort of consumer friendly and which rely much more on uh, information going between uh, PrEP users and people interested in PrEP use. Uh, and I so in terms of Eastern Europe, and I nearly forgot that, um, <laughs> we're starting to see rollout in Ukraine, um, uh, which is certainly kind of starting to give PrEP in um, useful numbers to its MSM population. They'd be the first to admit that they've only just started thinking about um, injecting drug users and women. Um, in Poland, where there's a network of PrEP clinics that managed to get going even despite the COVID situation and despite sort of the political situation there. Very small numbers as yet in other countries, Georgia a few, uh, Moldova a few. Um, Kazakhstan recently uh, announced it as a licensed PrEP, but in most other countries, it's very small pilot studies, or uh, partially, I think, due to stigma, partially due to caution by the politicians and healthcare providers who still think it's going to be frightfully expensive and difficult to arrange when it doesn't have to be. But we're starting to see it creep into Eastern Europe, which is really good news. Well, well that is good news. And um, Vanessa, what would you say is driving lower PrEP uptake in heterosexual, racially minoritized communities in the UK? Well, I think it stems from um, what I was um, saying before in terms of um, stigma, um, in terms of anything related to sex. So um, broaching the conversation and and being and feeling um, how would I say, kind of legitimized or confident to say, I need, I want something to protect me from HIV. And that means that I'm having sex and I'm proud to have sex. Um, mm. That conversation for a number of reasons in many communities is not something that many people feel comfortable with. Um, and the work that um, we've been doing with racially minoritized women in East London, um, in, in women, um, it, it's a, a lot of cultural issues that we can, we all, we, we can all um, relate to in terms of it, it being dependent on how you grew up, um, uh, what experiences you had. Um, you know, some women describe having difficulties in their relationships and experiencing um, violence, but they're not having the confidence, the agency to um, take PrEP or even go out to go and seek PrEP. So there's a, a number of layers to it. Um, and, and I think, one of the other key areas that has come out, particularly in um, racially minoritized women, is um, the fear factor. So a number of women have said, you know, I, I, I don't trust the data um, and I'm scared. Is it does it really work? Um, and this is another tablet. Can I trust it, etc. So that's some of the insight that we've been having. But I think, again, it's all related to um, not not getting the right education and not having the right awareness. Mm, yeah, very important point. And I, I want to ask you all, why can't we just go to our GP or our pharmacist and get PrEP? Do you think we're being too paternalistic? <laughs> well, um, I would... Available? Um, I very much hope that we will soon be able to do that. Um, in mm. France, you can go and get PrEP from your GP. Um, some countries have looked at uh, um, distributing it through pharmacies. Interestingly, COVID has meant that some countries have had to be imaginative about where they provide PrEP. Um, I think there is still a sort of protectiveness about it um, and that, uh, you know, there is still this sort of feeling both by 
clinicians and also by some prep seekers that they want reassurance. But I, I think eventually it will get provided in a variety of different settings. What do you think, uh, Sheena and um, Vanessa? Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're, you're right, Gus. I think more in maybe some, you know, countries than, than others. I mean, I am struck by the fact there's still quite a few European countries who don't have any nurse-led prep prescribing at all. Um, you know, which is something yeah. we've we've had here for, for a long time. And I think that's a, one step in the direction, the right direction. GPs, you know, it is a GP service in Australia, really, for, for, yeah. for PrEP. Um, and I think I believe that's the case in Israel. So I think there are other countries where it's predominantly. And that's great because then you've got a very broad range of practitioners who are familiar with PrEP and know to ask people about it. But I, I agree with Susan. I think pharmacy would be would would also be another great um, great place for you know for the outlets uh, at least for repeat prescriptions, if not um, mm. if not the first one. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I, I agree. I think it, um, it it also relies here on our commissioning and having more creative commissioning and giving us the flexibility to um, roll that out. But one issue, just to say, is it's it's also finding. Um, the right GP partners, and the right um, uh, pharmacy partners to roll it out. And not every partner will feel confident to do that, um, mm -hmm. but there are, there are many that will. And so I, I definitely think it's something that should be coming soon. Yeah, absolutely. And Winifred, welcome back. Lovely to have you. Are you, can, are you hearing me there, Winifred? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. Um, Winifred, What's been the impact of COVID-19 on PrEP rollout in the regions you work in? Um, first of all, I want to apologize for the, for the network. It was so bad here. It's 9 p.m. and it's a bit dark here. I don't know if you're able to see me right now. Can you see me well? Yeah, we can. <laughs> okay. So um, um, what has been the impact of, of COVID-19 on PrEP access? So... Um, one of the, the main issues that happened was the inaccessibility to the to the prep sites or to the health facilities that offer our prep services uh, to the young women and girls because of the lockdown it was so hard to travel because the president had to to issue some guidelines and and some of them restricted uh, use of public transport so uh, quite a number of, of young women were not able to access uh, prep services because of such a challenge but also due to due to COVID-19, there was limited information and awareness in, regarding access to PrEP. So, so many young women were not able to, to, to get uh, key facts regarding PrEP, but also issues of adherence to PrEP were really eminent. So COVID-19 brought a huge gap when it came to access to HIV prevention in my country. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Winifred. And have we seen an impact of COVID-19 on HIV prevention in the UK, um, Vanessa and Sheena? I mean, I, 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 I can um, start. I, I think that there's there was a, um, a definite um, initial impact, but I think it, essentially as we've seen through COVID, so many services just restructured it to reframe around all the limitations around um, COVID. So in terms of changing the face-to-face -to, -face to um, virtual consultations, um, sending out packs if it were avail if, if it were possible, um, rest restaging the timing of bloods so that um, it, it gave that flexibility. So I, I, I definitely think for some parts of the country, um, there there has been and probably continues to be an impact. But I think for, for many services and particularly in London, I think we were quite resilient with it and reshaped services swiftly to support. I don't know how you feel, Sheena. No, I think we were actually very lucky that already there was access to self-sampling and, and remote mechanisms for for testing and and that really made a big difference but of course COVID-19 also had a big you know big influence on people's ability to meet um never mind about having sex <laughs> so you know that was a that was certainly a big problem uh, I think um but uh, but yeah no I think you're absolutely right we were lucky that we had already those services for online access mm -hmm. to testing um 
And, mm -hmm. and but I, I don't doubt it was difficult in, in some parts of the country for sure for people to get into a clinic when they had symptoms. And, and that I, I think was must have been very hard. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, an area of HIV prevention people are always asking me about is when are we going to have injectable PrEP? Sheena, can you tell us what that is and when we can expect to have it in England? So that the the first um, the first uh, injectable prep that that's been through the clinical trials is a long acting in injection of a drug called cabotegravir, which uh, which uh, is an integrase inhibitor. For those of you familiar with how these drugs work in the different classes, it's an injection that needs to be given every two months, and it did spectacularly in two trials um, when it was compared to um, daily prep uh, to oral prep. Um, and I think that is because they, they deliberately tried to recruit from populations who were struggling to take daily prep on a regular basis. Um, but in both of these studies, one was conducted in, in gay and other men who have sex with men and transgender women, and the other one in, in women, it was shown to be better than uh, daily Truvada in those populations. So that's made it super exciting. Um, and um, WHO and in, indeed the, the regulators in the US, that they've agreed to fast track the approval. So I think the first review and potentially approval will come out in March or April of next year from, from the US regulators. And then on the back of that, WHO will follow swiftly with their recommendations. Now, Susan, your question was when we have it in England, that that I think is a long way down the pipe. <laughs> um, and it's this old story about, you know, what does the drug cost? And um, the drug companies have to recoup their profits and it remains on patent for the wealthier countries for a longer time. And um, that was something actually I did want to ask Gus about with respect to Eastern Europe and, and <laughs> countries that, you know, are sort of high income, but actually struggling a bit financially, where, yeah. where drugs, you know, can be very expensive. I think that that can be a challenge, I think, in, in those settings. Um, yeah. But yeah, simple short. Sorry, I'm meant to be answering short. And I think it's several, <laughs> years, several years down the, down the, 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 the pipeline. Right. And, and what, what do you think, Gus, in terms of Eastern Europe? Um, well, I think it, I, I mean, the patenting issue is really important. Um, interestingly, even in terms of drugs that we are now used to um, having as generics for PrEP in Russia, for instance, Trivada is still on patent. Mm -hmm. um, there is extraordinary, uh, and this isn't to do with patents, there is extraordinary diversity in Europe, Western and Eastern, uh, for the amount of money that certain countries pay for PrEP. Some countries pay 10 times as much as other countries. So there's no sort of unification there. And it's all shrouded in secrecy and government negotiations with companies. Um, I think the um, the injections, are, uh, in, uh, injectable PrEP is a very exciting idea. Um, but it's not just about the cost of the drug. There was a very interesting um, presentation at EACS, which I think we've just put up on AIDS map from uh, we already have the injectables now licensed as HIV treatment, but Canada is just about the first country in the world to actually start giving it to patients. And we had a very interesting talk from the doctor who's doing this. And it's not just about cost. It's also about clinical capacity, about where you do it. Very interestingly, um, uh, they've signed up with a sort of access scheme, which might enable people to get the uh, regular injections they need, which is every two months in the case of treatment at home or at pharmacies, yes, um, or at various other places, uh, in, uh, including sort of, you know, um, infusion suites at GPs and things like that. Um, so I think it will also throw yet another challenge to restructuring the healthcare care um, uh, deliver, de delivery industry in order to allow injections to be more widely used. Um, they will come um, because, the, 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 as Sheen said, the, um, the trial results were spectacular. 90% reduction in women over and above oral prep, which is extraordinary. Um, but it will take some time yet. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And and Winifred, how appealing do you think injectable prep is going to be for women? Um, I think um, we've had conversations with with some of the young women right now, and they're so excited for the long acting injectable prep because, for instance, uh, the sex workers in my country, some of them 
have been having issues with adherence to oral prep and and they're so excited to 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 get the long acting injectable prep the, the by monthly one because it will address issues of poor adherence but also uh, different women have uh, different needs so it's it's a subject that is thrilling in my country yeah, brilliant and and that was a question from the audience and another question from the audience that I would like to pose to you, Sheena, is um, does PrEP mean that there's no need for an HIV vaccine now? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, Susan, so I think there will be some regions that would feel that, that actually um, that is the case uh, for them. But when I look at um, the epidemic in, in, in countries in sub-Saharan Africa, I'm thinking particularly of South Africa, which has a very large population, huge numbers, um, you know, newly infected each day. I, I, is it 4,200 young women every week newly acquire HIV in South Africa? And it's really frightening, that sort of number building up week on week on week in terms of how you cope in a treatment program. These are, are young people and they will be on needing treatment for the rest of their lives and in that setting I, I think something something more like a vaccine is really needed to to break that that cycle but and I, I don't think oh, and where are we with yeah, I, know. The population. <laughs> I know we were in a session I know we had that session about yeah. HIV yeah. vaccines where, where are I we at with that I think my take home was was quite a long way, probably. We've got two more two trials at the moment that are still in efficacy testing, and we will see what they deliver. But I, 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 I and, you know, I'm I am I am hopeful always. But I think my my take from the basic scientists, the translational, the design scientists, if you like, is that actually there is there is more exciting um, structured um, immunogens coming down the pipe. And what we have learned from COVID-19 from those RNA vaccines actually could be very useful for evaluating these in, 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 in rapidly and uh, uh, rapidly and then selecting what you're going to take to scale. So I think there's more promise in the future and, and probably it's still a, a decade away uh, or more. Right. Thank you. And are there any other exciting HIV prevention tools in the pipeline, Sheena, that your... Well, we, we've got the broadly neutralizing antibodies. Um, that's uh, that those have been in trial. There's a kind of proof of principle of those. Um, but again, they're sort of not exactly back to the drawing board, but having to think about combining more of those together. And then if we think about the use of antiretroviral drugs that work for treatment and for PrEP, then I, I think is Latrovir, which is a, a drug um, that's kind of in a unique class of its own um, and that is in, in studies um, for prevention and treatment um, is looking quite promising. That is a, at the moment a pill that you take once a month um, and a little bit like the long acting injectables, you know, the, the need, you know, the ability to be more discreet about taking that sort of prep is, is likely to appeal, I think, to, you know, to, to people. And that could be formulated as an implant, a little bit like the contraceptive implants. Uh, again, something that young people can be very attracted to because it's in and they don't have to think about it. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there is, there's definitely choice coming down the pipeline, which we Fantastic. love. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, choice is incredibly important, particularly for women. Winifred, how important do you think the depivirine ring is going to be for women? Um, I think uh, the Pivrin ring one offers a choice for women and and it is something that you can uh, take on privately. We've had issues of, 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 of violence because someone is taking oral prep and, and their partner is assuming that they are on ART. So with the vaginal ring, the, 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 the Pivrin vaginal ring, it gives you the power to use it. You are confident to use it. And unlike other products, which have been uh, gendered, like the, the male condoms. The Pivrin ring is, is owned by the adolescent girls and young women. So it is a product that we are looking forward to here in Uganda. And we've been advocating uh, to ensure that the Ministry of Health um, accelerates its introduction in the market. 
So the Dapi Brennan gives us the power and the confidence. It's owned by us, the young women. Wonderful, thank you. And, and Gus, do you anticipate any challenges in making these new technologies more widely available? Um, well, yes, uh, there will be cost, um, particularly with PrEP. The only reason that we've managed to distribute it so widely and it's not widely enough as yet is because uh, we now have <clears throat> quite cheap generic drugs. So there will have to be a lot of negotiations um, with companies and uh, governments in order to uh, make it possible to introduce it at scale. Um, and that's not just, as I say, for the drugs, it's about sort of um, developing new services to, to, to make them possible. But I am excited, probably more than I am about the injectables, about um, the long-lasting pills. Um, there's another drug, Lenacapavir, which is under development at the moment, which could be administered as a six-monthly um, subcutaneous injection, a little jab, you know, just here, not, not some great big injection, um, which you've got at the moment. Um, great thing about implants is they can be removed again um, if you decide you no longer need protection or get side effects. But I think once a month pill is the, is, is the, the nearest exciting development um, because, as Sheena says, uh, or was it Vanessa? I can't remember, sorry. Um, you could go along to your clinic or to a pharmacy or um, a GB or somewhere like that or just a community centre um, once a month pop this one pill and you're protected. Uh, and that would be extraordinary. Um, and I think uh, I mentioned specifically community centres because one of the things, one of the take homes I got from EX is that community organisations were absolutely key in keeping uh, the supply of HIV treatment going during the COVID epidemic. And I think they could play a great role and increasingly important role in HIV prevention too. One of the reasons PrEP is expanding in Ukraine is that there is a kind of partnership between the medical organizations and the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, the health organizations, and they are doing the assessment for PrEP. Uh, in a lot of cases, um, where previously it would have been done by uh, doctors, uh, and that's a real step forward. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Gus. And got a question from the audience. Uh, I'm going to pose initially to Vanessa. Um, women sometimes find it difficult to take prep because people ask them questions about what it is and can judge them harshly. What would you recommend to a woman who has this concern? So. Firstly, I would say that um, the perception of what a sexual health clinic and what happens in, in, in clinics, um, it, it's important to know that in many, most clinics, um, we are focused on being non-judgmental, welcoming. It's a safe space to be open and honest about sex, to be open and honest about what you're experiencing. And any questions that are being asked are rather asked to make sure that we're giving you the right um, um, advice, that we're providing you with the care that you deserve and need. And so I would say that please don't let that concern stop you engaging with services. And also, um, I talk about this a lot, um, and this is slightly tangential, but if you are, if you don't have a positive experience in, in a service, let them know. Um, don't sit on it, because the only way that services in general can improve for everyone, if people know that they're not meeting the needs of everyone. Um, so, but the generally the questions are for us to understand what's the best care to give, and we are non-judgmental, we're open, friendly, here for you to make sure that you can experience sex and enjoy sex in the best way possible. Okay, wonderful, thank you. And I have another question from the audience. Um, do the panel feel young, young people are told enough about how to protect themselves from HIV? Um, Winifred, what would you say? Okay, um, I think um, this is one of the issues that we've been trying to address, especially <clears throat> in my country. Um, young people feel they're not being told enough because one, when you look at uh, their parents, they assume that these young people don't know what's happening, they don't know what sex is, and also some of their policies are not supportive, the sexual and productive health policies are not supportive of of, of awareness regarding HIV. For instance, in schools, 
you know, some of the policies restrict um, sexuality education from happening in schools. So, so young people are not being told enough. And then the other issue is is culture. Culture prohibits uh, young people discussing issues relating to sex. So, when it comes to access to HIV information. It is something that young people feel is not enough. And I think we have a lot of work to do. We should provide this information. We should provide them with key facts because we have internet. Some of them go to the internet. and you know the internet is overloaded. So I think we have a lot of work to do to provide them with information so that they can protect uh, themselves from HIV. Some of them are sexually active. And, and when they visit the health facilities, the health workers do not give them condoms because they will say, oh, you're below 18 years and you're not supposed to use condoms. I think they're sexually active. So we have to, to give them this information. We have to tell them a correct information, which is age appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a very important point. And I remember when I went to university a very long time ago, there, there was, I remember in Cosmopolitan, there was a whole campaign about smart girls carry condoms and um do you think that we're doing enough in the uk now about educating young people about how to protect themselves from hiv sheena mm, that's probably a good question i mean i think there's quite a lot of sex on our magazine still so <laughs> i i guess that is that is good I, 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 you know, it, it, it is having those conversations going and whether it's on a letters page or it's in articles. I mean, there's obviously been an explosion of stuff around COVID and intimate partner violence, but actually there are stories about sex too. And I think that is good and it gets people talking. And to come back to Vanessa's point and Winifred's point, you know, if you can get these conversations going in women's groups or youth groups, or so someone doesn't feel alone, I remember when we did the vaginal microbicide study, eight or nine women used to all come together, even though, you know, they could have spaced out their appointment, but they liked just coming together and sitting in the waiting room together and chatting about how much they love the gel. And I think, you know, that this sort of sense of community and belonging to a community who are all doing the same thing is very reassuring. And, uh, you know, I think we have learned from that wonderful work they've done in Cape Town, that if you, that if you disclose to more people you'll be supported and actually that will help you to, to you know, to carry on taking your prep. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And Gus, do you think um, young gay men, there's much of a conversation around protecting themselves from HIV? Um, you know what? I don't know. And that's because I'm such an old fogey these days. I don't know where young gay men meet each other. <laughs> no, <it's true. laughs> I, don't, I don't even have a grinder account. Um, <laughs> So I think seriously, there, seriously, there there is a sort of generation gap in terms of the you know, people and how they are talking to each other about sex. Uh, I think I see what I see is that there is more willingness to talk about sex, but whether they're really talking about what they actually do. Uh, mm. Mm. Um, so there is that. I mean, I think generally, I mean, um, I, Sheena brought up a very important point about sexual health services in general. And if there is a rule of thumb that gets people coming along to sexual health services, it's, it is they will come if they see people like themselves there. And this applies to services for trans people, as for instance, um, you know, a clinic queue in um, central London and places like that. Um, this applies um, to uh, to services for women, it applies to services for all, all um, minorities within HIV. It's, there's been some fantastic work um, running trans clinics by trans people in Southeast Asia um, with, with a huge uptake. Um, so I think what you need, you need um, friendly people who, uh, who def not just who are friendly doctors, you need friendly people who actually appear to belong to your own community there as well. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just about having them there as volunteers, but you know, if, you, if they're employees of the clinic and are part of it's what, what's running it, even better. Mm -hmm. And I think those, those are, you know, if you see people like yourself, you will be feel much more reassured. Mm -hmm. And is that what you're seeing in clinics, Vanessa? Um, in terms of how people, young people talk about sex, yeah. um, yes, I, I think, um, I, I, I don't think young people do know enough about protecting against HIV or um, uh, any other STI. I think that um, they, 
there's a lot of peer-based um, interactions and learning, like most people. But if you're not getting the right information from your peers, you know, um, incorrect information gets passed on. And I and I think that there there does need to be more work in getting the education out there. I think it's difficult because in schools, um, it, it's the the laws. Uh, um, rules and policies around it can sometimes limit it. So I do think that we need to make a lot of effort in community organisations, in shopping centres, etc., and in magazines. As Sheena says, keep the conversation going and have multiple channels of accessing information. And I completely agree with um, what Gus says about seeing people like yourself in, in clinics. And I, I'm always, a, I really feel that our clinics need to change into kind of sex positive spaces where we are, yes, we're talking about treating infections, yes, we're talking about um, diagnosing, but it's all about how can you promote sexual wellness and removing the shame from it and any stigma from it so that, you know, you come in groups because someone else is talking about it, someone else is learning, I want to learn too, and there's no shame in learning and enjoying it, so yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And and Sheena, how important would you say HIV testing is in prevention? Well, I think that's where the journey starts, <laughs> mm. I guess, you know, for everybody. And uh, so I think it's absolutely critical. Um, and I was really impressed with that sort of, um, you know, that kind of possibility that we might even have testing that people um, would deliberately have to opt out of in in a UK setting. Um, I think it's it's sort of I don't know what others think of that. I know it's been controversial in the past, but I think we've reached that stage now when to really help um, help people, um, we need to make it as easy as possible to have an HIV test, um, and then as easy as possible to test frequently. And as Vanessa and I we were saying earlier, you know, with this remote ability to do self-sampling, to do self-testing, that's all got a lot easier amongst people who are already aware of the usefulness of testing themselves for HIV. But we've got a huge population in UK and I guess in every country um, which, which has never had a test for an HIV. So to try and facilitate that and make that easy, I think would, would be a really great thing to do. And there will be you know, small numbers, but important numbers of people who would benefit from an offer of treatment you know, now. Um, and, yeah. and so that would be a really good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we've seen rates of HIV drop significantly in the UK. How much of that would you say is PrEP? And how much of that would you say is treatment as prevention? So I guess we're, we're never really going to know the answer to that uh, with a precise number. Um, but no one is going to not want to have the combination of all of it together. Um, the different models come up with slightly different, um, you know, ideas of, of what's making the major contribution. Um, but I think, you know, you can see really clearly that there uh, are individuals who will really benefit from PrEP today. And if they don't have PrEP today, then we're all going to benefit from them having treatment tomorrow. And it is this sort of extraordinary continuum that we all can be on, on that journey of not being at any risk, then being at risk of catching HIV, then having caught HIV, and then no longer being at risk of passing it on. You know, this is where the whole thing goes together. Testing, um, prep, treatment, the whole thing. We need it all. Susan, yeah. regardless of which one's doing the most. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I would agree completely. And I've got a question that's come through from the audience. Do you think partners have been involved enough to provide information about the new biomedical prevention options? And if not, how can we explore this deeper for better uptake? Who fancies taking that? Um, I, I can talk a little bit about um, studies in gay men. Um, Australia, that's had a, probably the biggest, earliest prep program, apart from the States, they did a couple of studies in gay men about, um, there was one that was about HIV positive uh, men talking to their partners about U equals U. Um, 
And it took the negative partners quite, and we're talking about settled couples here, you know, we're talking about uh, long term couples. It took them quite a bit of time before they really sort of kind of trusted that message and, and took it on board. But I think, uh, I think partner discussions are really important. Um, I've had experiences myself of kind of, you know, talking about uh, prevention ideas um, to partners, um, including, you know, somebody I knew who was a doctor, though not I would say working in sexual health, for whom PrEP was a completely new idea, um, and now talks about it a lot with his colleagues. So that does, uh, I think it's a, I think it's important. It's, again, the same sort of example as those discussions amongst young people. Mm, absolutely. I mean, I'm conscious we've only got five more minutes, but we've got a, another brilliant question that's come through. Is PrEP still necessary when we get to the <laughs> point when most people are undetectable? Who fancies that question? Well, I can say a little bit about this because it's partly the same thing about what, what's due to PrEP and what's due to, to treatment as prevention. There are a couple of studies. Um, there's one from Scotland of all places, but not all places, because Scotland has been really successful in rolling out antiretroviral therapy, and they already saw their HIV incidents fall because of that. But they look, it looks as if there's been an additional fall after they started rolling out PrEP as well. So there's some modelling that suggests that they both have a part to play. And I think there's more Public Health England or whatever they're called these days, they've changed their name, are doing some modelling, which uh, I expect to be presented next year. What do you think, Vanessa? So I think the key word here is most. Um, and that's the key thing that, yes, there are many people that are undetectable, but the there is there are a significant body of people that aren't. Um, and it's, as I think exactly as Sheena says, is that it's not just about, it's not prep, it's not testing, it's all together. Every every person's life is dynamic. Risk is dynamic. Um, and the I, and I also think that, you know, it's great the advances that we've made in HIV, but they're not equal across all populations. And uptake of PrEP is not equal across all populations. And so that's what we need to focus on to making sure that we've got, it, it's, it's not most, it's everyone is undetectable. Everyone who's living with HIV is diagnosed and everyone is aware of PrEP and has access to PrEP. Yeah, absolutely. And and Winifred, a, a question over to you. Do you think condoms are still significant? Yes, condoms are still significant because, again, we are looking at the combination prevention approach. Um, some people are not comfortable with, with taking daily oral prep, and then we still have um, some people who are not adhering to their treatment, and then we have some people who are, not, who are completely not using either. So we need to have um, a range of products targeting different categories of people and based on need. So we still need condoms, but also uh, condoms offer dual protection, protection against HIV um, and other STIs, but also um, unwanted pregnancy. So we cannot do away with, the, with condoms. That's my yeah. thinking. Absolutely, very good point. And we've only got two more minutes left so one quick fire question to you all what are you most excited about in terms of new um, prevention options coming either in the short term or the long term starting with you gus i'm going to say something you don't expect because i'll probably go you thought i'd go on about injectables and vaccines but i want to go on about hiv home testing because sheena's right testing is the start of it all and there's a great Polish doctor, Miosz Palczewski, who said at EX, look, we managed to roll out home testing for COVID in three months. We've had home testing for HIV for 10 years and we still haven't got it. So I would like to see a lot more home testing and also testing in um, non-medicalized settings, because I think that's how you get more people testing for HIV. Wonderful. Thank you. Sheena? Yeah, I think Gus is absolutely right there. But if I was looking in the prep space, I do think it is the long acting things that can be taken discreetly, whether that is a, a an implant, a pill, or a you know, or or, or a diaphragm, I guess, or a, a ring or a, a long-acting injectable. I think that, that we there's clearly been a gap. The trials have shown that, and that will be great to fill that gap. Wonderful, thank you. And um, Winifred, um, I think everything is exciting for me. Uh, the the long-acting injectable prep and ART. 
the vaginal ring and then the dual pill. I, just like HIV is revolving, and we need to also see our, our research uh, revolving because we have new technologies. So for me, it's exciting. The future is bright. I also look forward to the to the vaccine, the HIV vaccine, and eventually a cure. So I'm so excited about everything. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And finally, Vanessa, what does that leave for you? I know exactly, but I, I'm 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 looking forward to all of that, and also the way that we deliver it and get it out there and being creative and not just sticking to the status quo. So that's what I would say. A musical <laughs> condom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we are now out of time. Thank you all so much for taking part in this conversation. It's been uh, brilliant, so much to think about. Um, thank you for to Matthew behind the scenes taking questions. Thank you to all of the audience who have joined us today. A huge thank you to Disruptive Live for doing your technical wizardry, making this event possible. And for more information, do please check out the AIDS Map website. Thanks very much. Bye bye.